business. There's a lot to talk about tonight. Um, as I say, dramatic business. The Yom Kippur War is very complicated. And uh, I'm talking about in the battle sense. And I'm always stuck when I have a middle audience, you know, to uh, meet the challenge. You don't want to go too far in one direction, get too technical for the military, because all the women fall asleep. And then on the other hand, if you get too uh, broad, then you miss what actually happened. So uh, that's my job tonight. Here we go. Let's do the Golan War. As I think everybody knows, Israel was attacked on two fronts, and they're two separate, uh, really, uh, front uh, battles. Sort of like the U.S. in World War II with the Pacific on the one side and the European on the other. And uh, each one has a dramatic uh, aspect to it. I think we all know pretty much, I'll show you the maps hopefully, if we can get them in order uh, of what we're talking about. But the Golan is right there, correct? The Golan is right there. So the, for, as far as Israel is concerned, the Golan War starts at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Shabbos, which is Yom Kippur. So Saturday, remember, these dates are going to matter. So you'll either hold cup or you won't. It's like a shear. If you don't listen the first minute, you can go to sleep. So um, I know that's never happened in Baltimore, but other places I understand it's happened. Now, um, so the war starts at 2 o'clock in the afternoon on, on Saturday afternoon. The Syrians just take off the camouflage nettings off the guns and start shooting. The Syrian artillery starts bombarding the Israeli positions. Uh, the Syrian engineering units cross immediately into Israeli territory and start doing all this engineering business, which is in real war. You got to come ahead and fill in the, the ditches, the tank ditches, and clear the minefields. So for 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock is pre pre preparation by the Syrians for actually sending the tanks in so that by nightfall at 6 o'clock in the evening on uh, October in uh, Yom Kippur in uh, Golan Heights, it's cold, hundreds of Syrian tanks start moving all across the lines. Okay? So there you can see the map, and it gives you a general idea at least. Uh, you don't want two detailed maps. So uh, all over the place, they start uh, crossing in there, as I say before, at nightfall. Now, Israel, of course, had conquered the Golan Heights in, in 67. And when they did that, if you paid attention last year, they could set up whatever line they wanted, because by the time the fighting was over in 67, they'd broken the Syrian army, and therefore they could stop wherever they felt like it, and that's what they did. They stopped along a line. They made military sense, meaning that the Israeli army commanded many hills and small mountains, some of these mountains as high as 4,000 feet. Now, it ain't Mount McKinley, which is 20,000 feet, but it's, um, how about Mount Washington in uh, New Hampshire? 6,000. Here's 4,000. So you have a couple places like that, which is great for defense. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, the Israeli generals in uh, 67 they decided this is the line we want to stop at, right? It makes the most defensible. But on that Saturday afternoon, Israel, as you know, had too few tanks. They only had 177 versus the Syrians could put together 1,500. And they had no infantry. There were 200 Israeli soldiers versus 40,000, okay? And so the reserves, Golda Meir had given permission, the reserves had been mobilized Shabbos morning at 9 o'clock. That means they gave permission to start, okay? We can show if you can get that uh, thing. If people remember, uh, they started at 9 o'clock, so people were in Shul, uh, because, you know, in Israel, there's no such thing as a 9 o'clock minion on Yom Kippur, correct? That's only in America. So uh, even here it's not so common. So uh, people are already in Shul. Uh, so I want you to keep track of the, of the timetable. So the attack is 2 in the afternoon. They've only started to begin to mobilize the, the soldiers to make the call up at 9 in the morning, or she gave permission at 9, so give it 9.30. So yeah, from 9.30 to 2 o'clock before, you know, the whole thing explodes. Um, how can they get to the Golan Heights by 2 o'clock in the afternoon? Correct? Let's say you're a, a guy in, in Tel Aviv or uh, Haifa or B'nai Brak, you, you know, we've all been in Israel, you physically can't get there, or it's difficult. I mean, maybe you're in Haifa, but if, you know, in regular places, it's difficult physically just to get there by two in the afternoon. The Syrians know the Israelis have been caught naked. The Syrian plan is simple. You overrun the whole Golan Heights on Saturday night. Did you hear what I said? They knew, they planned it out. They had the Russians with them. Uh, you start at two, it takes a couple hours to do the engineering business, then you come in at, at, at 6, you, use, uh, you, you overwhelm the whole situation in the course of the night before Israel can mobilize its reserves physically and send them into the Golan Heights. So that by Sunday midday, Saturday night and Sunday morning, so by Sunday 12 o'clock, which is the earliest they figure the Israelis can get their forces act together, it's already too late. 
the Syrians will control the whole Golan Heights, the whole high ground, and they'll fight a successful defensive battle against the Israelis who'll have to go up against the high ground. And Israel had a hard enough time against a much weaker Syrian army in 1967, as we saw last year. Right? Remember? It wasn't a pushover when they took the Golan Heights back in 1967 when times were quote-unquote good. It was a uh, tough going, lost a lot of people. Kal v'chomer ben benoshel kal v'chomer, if they have a whole much larger, much better trained, and much tougher Syrian army under a, a unified command under Assad, which is a dictatorship, which is good for war, and uh, they have a lot of Russian weapons and all the rest of it, Israel not going to be able to, I mean, just think about it a second. They're not going to be able to reconquer the Golan Heights, caught off guard like that in 1973. It, it, it can't be done unless you want to lose thousands and thousands and thousands of men, and even then, who knows? The Syrians even land commandos late on Mosi Shabbos by helicopters deep behind the Israeli lines to try to seize the bridges. Because the Golan Heights, as I think, again, we all know, we've all been there, there's one or two bridges that you cross over into. The Benot Yaakov, you know, if you come by the near the Sfas area, there's another one or two little ones. That's how you get in. You understand? So if you seize those, then you really, how can the Israelis come in? Physically, how can you bring the tanks and the soldiers there? So it's not a genius take to figure this out, but they weren't dumb. And so this is the basic plan. To complete Israel's string of bad judgments and shlim mazel, at the moment of the attack, General Chofi, who's the commander of the Israeli, Aluf Pikud Safon, of the Israeli uh, forces in the Golan, happened to be in a plane on the way to Tel Aviv for a conference. I mean, he doesn't know they're going to attack at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's Yom Kippur. They mobilized reserves. He's flying back to the Pentagon of Israel, the Boer, to talk about what should do. So it means at the moment of the attack, and for sometimes afterwards, there is no general officer commanding to coordinate the Israeli units. Okay, so you couldn't get worse than that. Particularly, basically, there are two groups over here. They're just going to have to uh, keep in your, in your mind. There was a 188th Brigade in the south and the 7th Brigade, Armored Brigade in the north. Uh, and, you know, he should have, whatever, there's nothing to talk about. So uh, the Syrian plan, as you saw on the map a little bit before, uh, it's for two attacking forces, one in the north and one in the south, to punch through on Saturday night and jointly envelop the rest of the Israelis in the middle. Here, you, I think you, you get the general idea. Look what I'm doing. You attack over here and you come up Azoi. You attack over here and you come up Azoi. You are both close together. The top and the bottom come together. So all the Israelis in the middle are trapped because you're cut off from your supplies, your reserves. You're, you're lost. That's how it goes. It's a very good plan. It's a simple, it's a very good plan. Now, um, this does not happen. That's the big story of the war. Uh, left more or less to itself, without clear guidance from a general officer in charge, the 7th Brigade, which is uh, the one we talked about later, which, was, which just arrived there on Yom Kippur morning. Remember we said last week? The 7th Brigade concentrates in the north and fights back very hard at the advancing Syrians. This is a crack brigade under Colonel uh, Bengal, Yanis Bengal, Avigdor Bengal. And I told you last week, he was expecting a war. He was different than the others. He didn't agree with the consensus. Even when he was in uh, charge of a brigade in Sinai, where they pulled him out and sent him to the north, weeks before he said, they're all nuts, this is a war happening. So although the Syrians will throw waves of tanks at him, Bengal, the 7th Brigade, will give the Syrians a bloody nose. So basically, it all depends. They had a good guy over here, they had a big guy over here. I don't want to call him a bad guy, but he wasn't as, as competent as, uh, as, the guy, as the first guy. So we're dealing with an eerie situation, my friends. These are night battles on October nights in the mountains. It's not an online set of tanks against another, like an 18th century battlefield, right? It's not like a whole bunch of tanks on this side and a whole bunch of tanks on this side, and, you know, they go at each other. That's not what the Yom Kippur War will be. It's clusters of tanks brawling with each other all over the place. And that's what happens Saturday, Sunday, and into Monday. Okay, that's the reality of it if you had the misfortune of being there at that time. So you're really talking about a situation of, you know, what they call mano a mano, right? Which means the hand-to-hand -hand fighting in the sense it's up tank, well, up, up close and personal, and it's also man against man. So it's, uh, you know, there's the Syrian commander, Jahani, and there's uh, the uh, Israeli uh, guy who's in the front lines, Kalani. I mean, literally in the front, the, the lieutenant colonel, and it's boom, bang, okay? Uh, it's also uh, not only mano a mano, tanko a tanko. It's a war constantly 
It's, that's what it is. That is what it is. Uh, it's, it's a dream for the tank soldier. You get what I'm saying? You know, like if you're, if you're in the armor corps of any army in the world, you love to chazer over the Golan Heights War of Israel in 73 because it's tank against tank. Get the stupid infantry out of the way. You know, it's pure, pure who's better. Who can shoot better, who can maneuver better, who had a better tank, and all the rest of it. And it's a tankist dream, but it's also a nightmare. Uh, let me say, before I can go farther, not a single Israeli tank on the Golan Heights in this war will not be hit. You hear what I said? There's not a single tank that will not be hit. It's just that some will be repaired and stuff like that, and some won't. Okay? So it's a business. It's a bloody business. And when I say it's mano a mano, tanko a tanko, it's not something to laugh at. You know, you're a poor guy stuck in there, and, you know, here comes tanks, and you're shooting at them, or shooting at you, and once he gets out of the way, there's another bunch of them. It's not a whole bunch at one time. It's a, it's a, gr a group here versus a group here. The Israelis, of course, are always outnumbered. Um, let's see, can we get this? Uh, is this it? Um, it's not exactly what I want, but it's, it makes the point. We'll be playing a little out of order over here today, but that's fine. We'll work with it. Seriously. Um, because what he says, of course, uh, true. By the way, not everything on these uh, history things are exactly correct. Not that I want to be picky, but it's not 150 tanks. You know what I mean? But it ba it's basically correct. The war, therefore, in the north, is a series of thousands of encounters between tanks. That's a lot. With the Israelis outnumbered, always, again and again, like this guy, is an Israeli tank or group of tanks moving around in confusion because there's no general officer in charge. They run through a bunch of Syrian tanks and they open fire. So this is a war of captains and lieutenants, majors. You see? That is the story of the Golan. Uh, in a perfect world, you'd have a master general in charge of everything and doing it, moving all the chess pieces right and all the rest of it. It's not, as you know, uh, what happened. In spite of the surprise in the overwhelming Syrian force, the well-trained Israeli tankists will take out numerous Syrian tanks, but they will not be able to stop the flood of Syrian might. Since it was around 6 o'clock at night, the Syrians could simply go around the Israeli tanks who were trying to stop them by picking them off. Remember, the Syrians know that once they reach the back of the Golan Heights, the Israeli tanks are cut off and they're over. Right? They're toast. So what's really going to happen is not so much that they'll destroy the Israeli tanks, all the rest of it, there are losses on both sides, but even if the Israelis are better, and they are better trained, thank God, uh, you simply go around them. And if you go around them, you're in the back, you, you won. Okay? So um, this is what's happening 
as you see, the, the, the goal of the series is to get to that line where I'm pointing over here. Because then it um, doesn't matter who's in the middle. Now, in the north, Colonel Bengal had posted, as you just saw in that uh, uh, brief piece, a second line of tanks. Uh, this was his great uh, war, so to speak. And as a from a professional point of view, whenever you have a battle, one thing you absolutely want, from a strictly professional point of view, you always have to have reserve. Okay? It's, it's, it's like a basic rule. In the South, they didn't have, they have 80 tanks. They had no possibility for reserve. And so if they break in anywhere, it's, it's over. There is nobody behind to plug it up. In the North, even if he has three or four, he's always keep a reserve. And, uh, and therefore, he's able to use that to stop here, stop there, any kind of penetration. The South, as I told you, the, gen the commander didn't do it. As a result, the Syrians seriously broke through in the South. Now, there are four bad problems for the Israelis that I would identify. Number one is knife fighting, and it, this is terrible what I'm about to say. Israel didn't have any infrared glasses, and the, and the uh, Syrians had them, okay? So what that means, of course, is they can see at night, we can't see at night. Just think about that. And that's criminal, okay? They didn't use them in 67. It wasn't necessary in 67. Israel can do without them, you know, that mentality. And you can't be cheap economical on something like that. But they were, and this was a terrible uh, problem. As, as you may imagine. Do you have the one on that? Infrared? We went to the entire night now. No. All right, then forget it. That's number one. Number two, yeah, we'll find it later. Number two, um, this is... E no, we just did that. We had that, Jay. He says, we had the fault. Then, number two, Israel had not did the following mistake. Here's the Golan Heights at the top, at the northern tip, is what's called Hermon, right? The Mount Hermon. At the very top, very high, as we know. So Israel had all the spy equipment up there. And they had all these uh, NSA types, where, you know, uh, listening in on the Syria. They had no defenses. So at the very beginning of the war, the Syrians landed a whole group of helicopter commanders over there, and they stormed and captured the place. Uh, the Israelis could hardly put up anything. That's unbelievable, because uh, you haven't heard anything yet. First of all, they captured the place. So they get all the high-tech equipment, which is top secret. Second of all, they captured the people. And now they have all these specialists. They can torture, get information out. And number three, to make matters even worse, they have what they call motor mouth. Okay? There was a guy there. Yes. It's, it's unbelievable. There was a guy there who was, it must have been some kind of Asperger's or some kind of situation. I'm serious. Something like that. I'm, I'm not speaking professionally, obviously. And he just had one of these photographic memories in a weird way. So, you know, if he, I know you. I know your social security number. I know it backwards, your, 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 your uh, telephone number, your, your license plate, these kind of, some people, you know, if you just see it once, they just memorize it. People like that are very dangerous in, um, in the intelligence business. And Israel at that time had what they called Kishlam Midur, which means... Really, anybody knows, even, even us can understand, you want compartmentalization. You only know what you need to know. But, you know, they weren't so good at that. And this guy is walking around in Tel Aviv at the headquarters. Uh, he was 23, 24 years old. Uh, Dati, okay, a kippah And he's a weirdo, so, he didn't, you know, if he, if he ever sees a, a paper here, he's not supposed to see it. He just memorizes it, all the rest of it. So he knows too much. He gets captured by the Syrians on the first day. They can immediately size him up, and they do, and they play mind games on him. You understand? And those, you know, if you have this kind of personality, if you have expert interrogators, which the Soviets, of course, have, then you know you can talk to them this way and that way to convince them Israel is destroyed. Whatever they do, and as a result, he spills the beans. Twenty years worth of intelligence information. I kid you not. He did unbelievable damage uh, uh, to Israel. He said so himself. And they never tortured him or anything like that. They just, you know, massaged and played along with him. His name was uh, Amos uh, Levenberg. He's still around. And uh, it was a, a beyond an intelligence disaster. You understand? Those as a cornucopia of top secret information, which I don't know how Israel, but he, I saw Israeli officers said later on they had to completely change their um, uh, passports and their names and all the rest because, you know, the Syrians and the Russians, everybody had all this information there for, for many years. It was a real disaster. And the guy was just uh, like a lemachal. He wasn't even an evil person, but he spilled and he sang like a canary. 
when, when the war is over, this is interesting, and he gets exchanged back for the prisoners, so they wanted to shoot him, basically. They, they wanted, the general said, well, put him in a room with a pistol and tell him, you know, do the right thing. Golda Meir said like this, his parents are Holocaust survivors, he's the only son, so let him go. And that's what they did. They, they said like this, he's Nechet he's like a war victim himself, and his biggest punishment is that, you know, he knows what he did. So he's still around today. That's him. This is an Israeli news show. Does this still pursue you, you know? That's not, it's, it's not necessary. Yeah. We don't have to see somebody suffering. You get the general idea. Um, so this was a second disaster, because now the Syrians know all the information and all the rest of it. Thirdly, in tactical sense, um, this is shocking, the IDF is still in a Yom Krav mode. Most of the generals thought, I mean, the guys on the front line, the colonels, thought, they thought, this is a Syrian incursion. It's not a Syrian invasion. You understand? So the goal is to establish a line of tanks to prevent the occupation of more land because they thought just coming and try to grab something. Had they been thinking in a war mode, they would have concentrated their own Israeli tanks, not cared about yielding ground, and devoted their efforts to destroying the Syrian armor units. Okay? In other words, the good old Clausewitz business, which is war is about destroying the enemy. Okay? War is about destroying the enemy and not about occupying land. Now, uh, I hope you caught that. The, this resulted in a thin line of tanks obviously being unable to stop a, a flood of Syrian tanks, and it attrited, attrition, attrited the Israeli tanks, meaning it's the wrong way to go, because when you have like that, bang, bang, I bang you, you bang me, I shoot you, you shoot me, you're going to lose, I'm going to lose also. Israel cannot afford to lose. They have hundreds of tanks. We don't have hundreds of tanks. So it prevented them from forming a concentrated armored fist that could damage the Israelis strategically, uh, and so the Syrians did strategically, and uh, 75 Israeli tanks are destroyed, 160 uh, Syrian tanks. Israel can't afford that. Okay? If you lose 75 tanks, the whole south is empty. Uh, and finally, there was an Air Force disaster. What a story. You see, by midnight, General Khofi came back, and he realized it's a war, and it's not just a, a raid. And he's freaking out. He said, so put yourself in commander's position. You're getting this report, this report, this report. You see, the whole place is falling down. Hundreds of Syrian tanks. Thousands, as far as he knows. He calls the chief of staff in Tel Aviv, General Elazar. He says, all is lost. We have to pull out of the Golan Heights. It's a disaster. The only thing that could possibly save us in the morning is the Air Force. Okay? So, uh, this is all wrong. Why do I say that? The Air Force is for certain things. Okay? It's not for others. You can't use the Air Force, you know, to stop tanks and all the rest of it when you still have not solved the problem that I spoke about the last couple of weeks, which is the SAM-6 missiles. They just simply don't know what to do. What are you going to do? The Syrians have the whole area covered with these stupid missiles. Israel doesn't have an answer to them, not, not at this time. So what's the point of sending up something to bomb a tank and save another Israeli tank? If the missile will shoot up and, and destroy the Israeli tank. Dozens of Israeli airplanes are shot down and destroyed as a result of this. And you know, we can't afford that. Okay, that's the most delicate of, of, of all the arms, okay? So um, this is all wrong. But Moshe Dayan was in a major panic. At one o'clock in the middle of the night, General Khofi ignominiously pulls back from the Golan Heights physically, goes to Tzfat, or Harkonon, you know, you know what that is, Mount Canaan? It's right near Tzfat, that's the uh, army headquarters. And so he can direct the battle from behind, uh, safely from the rear. I mean, it makes sense, but it's kind of humiliating. And from Mount Canaan, he can see You've been in spot like I have. If you look the other way, you can see the Canaries, you can see all the way to go on all the other business. So just imagine you're there at night in October and you see the, the flames, you know what I mean? Blowing up here, blowing. You can see the whole business. It's like a terrible, scary movie. Okay? Uh, by Sunday morning, the Syrians stymied in the northern sector by this Colonel Bengal and this Kalani guy that we saw had totally destroyed the Israeli army in the southern sector and it overrun most of the southern Golan Sunday morning. 
the Syrians could see the Kinneret and Tiveria. The Israeli army, 10 tanks left in the whole southern Golan. When Moshe Dayan helicopters to the Golan at dawn, and he discovers the Syrians are near his own headquarters of Degania. You know what I'm talking about? Down at the bottom of the Kinneret, I think you know what I mean. So the old, the famous Kibbutzim, and the Syrians are nearby, and they're about to break into Galilee. Moshe Dayan panics, and he orders General Pellet, the commander of the Air Force, and he says, like, drop whatever you're doing. They were supposed to have a special attack on the Suez front. They had, like I told you before, worked at a ballet. And Moshe Dayan said, drop everything and send all the Air Force to blast the Syrian tanks and prevent them from coming to Deganya, prevent them from coming into Israel itself. General Pellet tries to protest. He said, that's not, we don't have a plan for this. You can't work at the last minute. It's not how the Air Force works. Dayan is overrules him. He says, I'm just giving you an order. I don't want to hear about all that. And so an unprepared and uncoordinated Israeli Air Force hurls itself into the Golan and is slaughtered. Okay? Because, as you see over here, the Air Force is, really, is, a, is, is a racehorse, it's not a, a farm horse. Okay? You can't use it except in the way that it can be used. You know, racehorse is great for racing. I don't know if it's good for pulling a, a car. So the pilots in the Israeli Air Force, they can do certain things. The, 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 the job of the generals is to, like for a doctor, right? I mean, if you're doing an operation, a scalpel is for one thing, and you know, the, 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 the scissors or whatever is for something else. Uh, it's the same way. So you can't use this, misuse it, but it didn't help. So the Israeli Air Force does not help at all on the northern front. They just lose dozens of phantoms, all the newest planes and pilots. It was just a terrible error. In the end, what saves the Israeli position of the Golan Heights is not the Air Force, but the Miluim, <laughs> the fat, uh, <laughs> you had a reservist who called suddenly on Yom Kippur, guys in their, in their late 20s, their 30s, their 40s, uh, in, in a shock and not really ready. Uh, the reservists, the tank soldiers, who always outnumbered and always not properly coordinated, slug it out with the Syrians in bloody battles all Sunday. Okay? What shines is the initiative of the lower officers, as I said before. Here's a, a very famous example in Israel. It's very well known. Read what it says. One of the lethal holding actions that became legend was a young lieutenant named Svi Greengold, Svika, and um, whose hit-and-run tactics credited with single-handedly holding back a major thrust by 50 tanks, or more really, guerrilla-style tactics on the route leading towards the brigade's headquarters caused the Syrians to believe they're up against a whole Israeli force. Never more than, uh, after more than 10 of his own tanks were destroyed, the Syrians withdrew, the commander told, uh, to, to hold, deciding to hold off and deal with the Israeli force at daylight. Gringo continued to engage the Syrians all through the night and the following day, destroyed a bunch of tanks until injuries, burns, and exhaustion caught up with him, he's evacuated, recovered, and was subsequently, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's an understatement of what it is. Basically, and this is, an ex this is typical, uh, not exactly in his way, but what I'm about to describe is typical. The war starts on Shabbos. It's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The invasion really starts at 6, as I said before. Um, so if you're called up, you know, you got your call to go, guys get on cabs, and cars and stuff like that, and they literally run up to the Golan, you get to the bottom, and the army's trying to get his act together, which they can't do, and they simply say like this, who are you? He says, I'm a lieutenant, he just finished his school, he just finished lieutenant school, I'm a lieutenant, you're a lieutenant, good, you're in charge of these three tanks, you know, four tanks, now get up there and, and, and go forward. <laughs> they have weapons, they have, don't have weapons, They're, hopefully they have enough fuel, they, they load up on the way, uh, hi, how are you? You know, I'm, I'm in charge now. I mean, it was like that. It was, they didn't have days and days to get ready like in 67 in a couple weeks so that the plans can be implemented and, you know, these four guys are, are, are designed for that tank and they've trained together before and they are now part of a unit and the unit follows under orders and it goes in a coordinated way and all the rest of it. That's what happened in 67. Here's Chaplava, as they say. So the guy comes up there and it's three, four tanks, or whatever it is, and he's like this. The Syrians are somewhere out there. They're coming up this road called the tap line rope. Go out there and stop them. And he goes out there. As you see, he sees a, a tank in the front. They start shooting. And, you know, he hits some of them. They hit some of his guys and all the rest of it. These, this guy and others, it's unbelievable. They get hit. Uh, he gets burning. They jump out of the tank. They roll on the ground to put the burns out and cover the burns. They go and jump in another tank and keep fighting. It's unbelievable. You understand? They call Koch Tzvika, you know, the, the Tzvika force. But that happened 
you know, kind of often. And without that, that's called lower initiative, correct? This is not something directed from the generals. You just do what you think you have to do. And basically, I'm cheref nav shalamus. You go into battle, think like this. I'm not coming out of this, that's all. You know, the, the forget that. You know, it's not happening. But we're going to take as many of these guys out as we can. Because what are we supposed to do? You know, let them come in. So it's just an unbelievable situation. Um, all during that Saturday night, the generals at the headquarters, uh, David el Azar, the, the chief of the staff, in the Boer, in the Pentagon, in Tel Aviv, have been, they don't have my benefit that we know what happened in hindsight. They've been trying to understand the situation without the benefit of hindsight. Ever since Saturday morning, mobilization been going on, which meant that although it took time, as I just told you, thousands of reservists are heading to the area of Tiveria and such areas to assemble, to physically organize, like I said before. You know, you three guys, okay, get into the tank. He's well, I don't know how to drive. Well, learn how to drive now. You know, I'm gonna drive. Now, actually, they do know how to drive because they're taught all four, but usually the guy doesn't do it, so it's a learning skill again. You're gonna learn on the way up. You get it? And you're going to get your ammunition over here and over there. There was a gas station <laughs> in Tiveria. The guy said, am I getting paid for this? I said, yeah, you're getting paid for this. Let's open up and, and fill up all the tanks, you know. Uh, I, I, I kid you not. Anyway, to get them in there, my favorite story is a guy jumps in from, uh, from Tel Aviv. He had been at a party. He just ran in. And they say, yes, you get into this tank. He jumps in the tank. And he's not religious. And he says, it's three, it's, it's three guys with kippah. So he says, guys, you're going into battle with atheists, <laughs> you know? So he says, okay, there's the only tank that in, that, in the big battle that comes that survives. You understand? So afterwards he says, guys, I'm, not, I'm no longer atheist. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so if there's a question about atheists in the foxhole, you know. But anyway, um, as I said before, it hadn't happened on, on, on Saturday. Uh, there hadn't been enough time, but by Sunday morning, by Sunday morning, all through night, things are different. The, re the reserves are starting to show up in dribs and drabs. The commander is uh, Colonel Ori Orr, who's not known here, but is known in Israel, uh, who's trying to put together the tank crews and send them up as, as soon as possible. He's the, uh, the well, we'll get him eventually. He's a, one of the big heroes that uh, nobody knows, because I said before, he's a colonel, and he's like this. You guys, one tank, move. You guys, another tank, move. And he calls them, there's three tanks coming, you guys get together over here and move up this direction. You know, he's trying to run the whole show uh, by himself, and he uh, will get uh, destroyed over there. Um, oh, these are the, can you have any with you? No, not that. That's it, go back. <laughs> this is the big hero. Nobody ever heard of. Uh, actually, in Israel, he's well known that when, when, Moshe, when Rabin, was the defense minister in the 80s. He was the number two. The man called the Misrata Bidachon. By the morning, the Syrians, happy with their victory in the southern Golan Heights at least, plan to attack the northern part and finish it off. In other words, it's not going to work like a pincer movement, so we'll go like I'm doing now. Up oh, and like that. In other words, we won in the south and hit them like that in the north. Uh, and uh, that becomes the Gettysburg battle of the Golan Heights War in, in Nafach, uh, Kikai Nafach, which uh, lasted all day Sunday and into uh, Monday. And I say Gettysburg because the two, uh, two armies stumbled into each other, and then it's one group whacking away at the other. You know, that's what it was, a bloody business. They just send in waves and waves of tanks, and the Israelis really send in their guys, which is much smaller. And this was a tough business. Uh, this is the headquarters of the Israeli army in the whole Golan Heights in Nafach. That's the, you know, not the north, the south, but the whole business. General Eitan. Here it is, as you can see in the center. And let's go to the next one. He be later became a famous uh, general, I mean, the commander in chief of the army. He makes a big deal in the uh, Yom Kippur War because uh, he's Johnny on the spot. He's in Nafak and he's got to direct now uh, the different units to fight it off. So, what are we talking about in real language? Here comes a whole bunch of Syrians in Israel, sends out five tanks. And they fight till they're destroyed or something like that. And then, then he, meanwhile, he, can he find another five and send them in there? Till they get destroyed and hold on, can you send another five? That's that's not much what happened over here. Uh, in the late Sunday morning and for the rest of the day, uh, slowly arriving tanks will be hurled by Eitan, General Eitan, and his generals at the large Syrian tank columns, as I just told you, bearing on the town. The town will be overrun by Syrian tanks and men. So the generals have to pull out. But the outnumbered Israeli tanks will rally again and again and counterattack again and again in the streets. 
driving the Syrians back with heavy losses, and the Israeli losses will also be heavy. So I told you before, it's Mamash Gettysburg over here. You know, it's a bloody business that goes on for days. And this was uh, one of the two or three central concentrated battles. You did not want to be there. The concentrated battles over here. And nowhere does Israel have the time and the luxury to organize an army and get a battle plan together and, you know, do it in an organized way. It's just uh, you know, improvised, helter-skelter. And, and that's what goes on. Do you have the one over here? Yes. The first and the second days of the Yom Kippur War were the most difficult days of my life. I needed more time. Because if I had more time, it would be another platoon, another company, another time to accumulate forces for defense. That heavy feeling I had on that first day, the second day, that I don't have the sufficient power to face the Syrians. And we came to expression in the most difficult battle I had. It was the battle of Nafa. Just shoot. John Wayne.
You see how old that kid was? Was he 19, 18? You see, that's what that, that, that's what you're talking about. Covered with junk all over the place, you know, cordite and gunpowder. It was a, it was a, it was a heck of a business. And as I told you before, it's the it's a war of the non-coms, of the sergeants, of the of the captains and the majors, are just running up and be, because the other guys say just run in there and do something. You understand? And you saw this guy Kalani he became famous for this. He just you know wherever we go, shoot, shoot, shoot. He said it was a, a misfire, meaning he's shooting at one and and it's a dud. That means he got to get it out of the barrel and put a good, a, a new one in. So if Israel hadn't had excellent training that the Armor Corps has, excellent training to what to do in any kind of situation, including when there's a misfire, it'd be all over because by that time they'd shoot him. So how many times did it happen that the training wasn't that good and the Syrians shot them instead? You know, we're, by definition, we're hearing from the survivors. We're not hearing, obviously, from those that didn't survive. There are many that, that didn't. So it was, um, as I say, a brawl. Um, I remember he, the, the colonel asked the Kalani, because he's staying in the behind, he said, what's going on over here? Trying to describe the battlefield. It's Lag Bomer. <laughs> he goes, what do you see Lag Bomer? A million bonfires, okay? So he says, do you want to know what the, what the battlefield looks like? It's Lag Bomer in, 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 in Tishrei, okay? Now, uh, Israel had its own sophisticated kind of weapons. Jake, do you have this one here? No, not that one. Okay, we'll get to it eventually. What about the south, though? What I just told you, what you just saw, was the better brigade, the seventh brigade in the north, which had a hard time. What about in the south, where they were just crushed and overwhelmed by the Syrians? Here the Syrians had destroyed the Israeli forces, right? Even though they themselves lost a lot of tanks to the stubborn Israeli defenses. Here the Syrians were messed over, looking in retrospect, by the agreement that they had made with Egypt. You see, and the Lord works in strange ways. Syria's war plan, what they worked out, had called for an attack on Saturday morning. They're supposed to start at 6 in the morning, 7 a.m. If the Syrians attack, attack then, to have an additional seven hours of daytime, of sunlight, they would have overrun the southern Golan and reached the Canarida, so by 6 in the, in the evening, agreed? If they started all day long, so you start 7 in the morning, Shabbos morning, by 6 or 7 Shabbos evening, they'd be done long before the Israeli reserves would have been able to have any time to show up on Saturday. The Syrians were not used to night fighting. Their training was a day for warfare. And with those extra seven hours of daylight, the Syrians would have performed better against the 75 Israeli tanks they faced, no matter how desperately the Israelis fought. Because a lot of what the Israelis were able to do in holding them back was take advantage of the fact that it's nighttime. Even though the other guys had night vision and infrared, but still, it's harder then. However... In order to coordinate a deal with Egypt, Syria had agreed to attack not at 7 in the morning, but 2 in the afternoon. So it'd be the same time Egypt attacks, which is seven hours after Golda Meir had mobilized the reserves. This threw a spanner into the Syrian attack plan. The Syrians in Hanami did crush the 77 Israeli tanks, but it took a long time and involved a lot of night fighting and heavy losses and meant the Syrians were not near the Kinneret not on Saturday night at, at 6 or 7, but till Sunday morning around 6 or 7, by which time the Israelis racing against time were sending reserves to oppose them sooner than the Syrians had counted on. The Syrian planners had thought that the Israeli reserves could not show up till 2 or 3 in the afternoon on Sunday. At the earliest, they hadn't counted on these guys like Ori Ori that we saw before, um, just zooming to the southern Golan, and spending all day long on Saturday afternoon radically improvising. So all this helter-skelter business I talked about saved Israel because it got the Israeli forces to the Golan earlier than the Syrians had counted on, even though it didn't mean that Israel won a victory on, on Sunday at all. In other words, President Assad of Syria paid a heavy price by teaming up with Sadat, and believe me, uh, Syria resents it to this day, of course, Syria is now an advanced state of uh, civil war, but nevertheless, they resent to this day. But don't worry, later on Assad will cause a lot of trouble to Egypt uh, in the war, Baruch Hashem. The bottom line is, the Syrians did not totally overrun the southern Golan Heights by the end of Sunday. Now I can show that uh, 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 piece you just had. Benot Yaakov Bridge. On the night of October 7th, the Syrian division reached this bridge and paused. Before them lay an undefended road 
that could take them straight into the heart of Israel. But to the division commander, it looked too good to be true. Knowing the perfect spot for an ambush, when he saw one, he stopped his advance and waited for dawn. This gave the Israelis just enough time to send troops up to stop him. After the war, the Syrian commander was executed for his poor judgment. I approve of the sentence, by the way. The, um, but actually, I want to tell you something. What you just saw is not true. Okay? That's the old history. It's not true. Today we know, it's, it sounds good. He said, saying it wasn't part of the Syrian plan to cross into Israel. You understand? That would have been unrealistic. The plan was to seize the Golan Heights. But it sounds very good. By late su sa Sunday night, not Saturday, we're only on Sunday. By late Sunday night, uh, General... Elazar, the commander-in-chief of the Israeli army, back in the Pentagon, had professionally assessed the situation. Now, now he caught what's going on. Israel had been battered, but they'd held. General Elazar had withdrawn on Sunday morning a splendid division facing Jordan and sent it north. So the general staff in Israel has what we call atudot, which means they have military units that are there at their... Um, Beck and call, you might say, to, to send to special situations. Uh, what about Jordan? Israel has a long front against Jordan. They said like this, King Hussein is not going into war. Not like that. Uh, it's not happening. So therefore, we don't, we're going to take a chance. We don't need the soldiers there. And they had a very powerful reserve division. They sent it up north already on Sunday to get there to try to save the situation. The commander of this uh, force, which will arrive there by Monday morning, so all Sunday and Sunday night, this division is moving up towards the Golan, up the Jordan Valley. You and I have driven up there many times. Must have been quite a sight. The commander is Israel's best tank general. Uh, he was an old man, so in Israel, you're 48, you're, you're over the hill. You know, he was in the reserves. I'm talking about Brigadier General Moshe Pellet. You've never heard of him, um, but I'll tell you who has heard of him. Uh, can we go to the next one? Yeah. If you go to uh, the United States Army Tank Museum, the Armored Corps Museum in Fort Knox. Uh, they have over there, uh, and those guys are really into the tank stuff. Uh, he's among the five best generals of all time, uh, tank generals. Okay, notice they have a Hall of Fame up there, and you can see the list of five greatest generals, and everybody's heard of Rommel, and everybody's heard of Patton. Maybe you've heard of Creighton Abrams, maybe you haven't, but nobody's heard of Bo Chappelle. Who the heck is that, right? But if you're in the tank business, you know what I mean? Those I mean the Armored Corps all around the world, they follow the 73 war. They follow all these kinds of businesses. As I told you before, the Yom Kippur War in the Golan was a tank war. Okay? So you had to use the tank in a thousand different ways. And he was Israel's uh, uh, best guy, meaning that he had trained and taught this stuff for 20, 30 years. Okay? So that's, as far as I'm concerned, that's high praise indeed. Uh, Pella drives up ahead of his division on Sunday to Mount Canaan, Harkonnen, right next to the spot. He says, General Chofi, and he says, what do you want my division to do? And Chofi says, I guess, the Golan is lost. It's over. The Syrians are going to break in, prepare a, def a desperate defense line for Tiveria and the Galil. Right? Uh, in other words, uh, the commander-in-chief had lost it. You understand? Now you can understand, it's what you call pressure, battle fatigue, and all the rest of it, but he was so overwhelmed by what he's seeing all day long on Saturday and Sunday, it's just like, oy vey, it's over. And uh, Pellet, this good general, he's freaked out. He drives to Almagor, you know where that is? It's also on the Israel side. It's near, not too, not too far from Sfat, okay? Uh, it's kibbutz. So uh, again, it's on the Israel side. So the battle is being fought on the Golan side, but the commander is over here on the Israel side. I think you understand what I'm saying. And he runs into Moshe Dayan there. And Moshe Dayan is crying his head off profusely. And Pellet, they all go back. These guys are all, you know, old Israeli army. And, and, and Pellet says, what's going on over here? And Moshe Dayan says, it's all lost. It says, the Bayesh Lish, Chorm Bayesh Lishi. It's destruction of the third temple. You know, the first temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. The second temple was destroyed by the Romans, by Titus. And the state of Israel is the third temple. And now it's going down. We've blown it. And, you know, the Syrians are going to break through. They've taken the Golan. It's a crash and all the rest of it. Now, that's because Diana has been getting all this bad news all day long. So you can understand the psychological business, but uh, General Pellet was made of sterner stuff. And he said, no, I don't agree. Here's what we're going to do. I think I'm going to do something else. I'm going to go on the offensive and kick the Syrians the heck out of it, out of Golan. 
That's what we're going to do. Okay? So in other words, get your act together. Serve yourself up. This is a dramatic human significant moment. Agree? Um, it happens in war, it does. It's the best of people um, that, you know, the, the events like overwhelm you. But then what's necessary is to get out of the way. Okay? It's not a pretty picture, but it's necessary to get out of the way. And uh, General Pellet calls the commander in chief of the army, Del Elazar, back in Tel Aviv, and he said, Get these losers out of here. He tells him, You know, is this a bad news? And uh, General Elazar, Dado, he said, I guess, All right, I'm going to send somebody up there who will take charge unofficially, because you don't want to tell the Israeli public we're firing the generals or any kind of stuff. So, unofficially, my predecessor, my best friend, General Barlev. Right? Chaim Barlev had been the commander in chief before him of the Israeli army, meaning he reached the top. So he was very good. By the way, both of these guys from Yugoslavia. So it's kind of funny, you know, they could, they could uh, uh, what's the right word? Talk to each other in, in Serbian. So if you're the Syrian thing, you hear, like, what the heck is going on over here? Uh, they, anyway, they both went to Shomar Sayir and that kind of thing back in a place like Zagreb and Belgrade. We forget there were Jews uh, in Yugoslavia. If you know your geography, northern Yugoslavia is Hungary. Agree? He used to be part of Hungary once upon a time, and after the First World War, he was given to Yugoslavia. You understand? So if you grew up there, you, the Yugoslavia actually was good for the Jews in the 20s and 30s. So whatever the case is, he said like this, General uh, Barlev is uh, well-rested, and he's a normal guy, and he's obviously been a great commander. He went risen to the top anyway, and so we're going to send him up there. He's not going to lose his, his head. And uh, that means for the next two days, three days, the man in charge of the north is a, a quote unquote a better general, um, and General Pe and Pellet says like this: It can be done. It's not going to be easy. But here's what we're going to do: We're going to go right up the the, the southern Golan, and we're going to kick them right out, out there. You understand? Um, this is not going to be a hot plop situation. We're going to get a battle plan together. I got a division. It's true we're outnumbered, but we're going to do this right, and we can do it. Okay, I'm going to say it's easy, but we can do it. We're not going to let the Syrians hold the parts of the Golan that they took. This is going to happen. Meanwhile, in the central part, because he's coming from the south, another fresh division is arriving under, really a guy who was Alta Cocker, 51 years old at the Israeli army, you know, Don Lanner. Again, these are not names that are so well known in Chutzlars, but they were well known in Israel. These are the old guys who fought in the Palmach, in the 48 war, in the 56 war, in the 67 war, you know, they've been around for a long time and they were uh, teachers in the Israeli West Point. They knew their business. You see, Don Lanner is, uh, is from Vienna, you understand? So uh, anyway, uh, it's going to be a different war, but, but that provided the Syrians don't succeed in knocking out the small number of tanks that are in the Golan Heights and seizing everything before the Israelis can launch a counterattack. So it wouldn't arrive until Monday's, in time for Monday's fighting. So the fighting on Monday, so we've done Saturday, we've done Sunday, by the time you get to Monday, it would turn out to be weird. In the southern Golan, uh, Golan Heights, General Pellet's division launches a methodical, professional, grand assault to drive to the rear of the Syrian forces in the Golan Heights. So that means we're going to come up the, from the south, and if we succeed, we'll do the opposite of what the Syrians want. We'll cut them off. You know, we'll go to the top, and we'll slice them, their uh, rear, uh, uh, um, and cut them off from their communications and their supplies. Um, the Syrians try to use the Sagar tactics on Pellet, meaning that what they were doing, I'll have to talk about unfortunately next week, which is if you use these bazooka type businesses which the Russians had gave them thousands of they, were, they uh, operate them with the wires, uh, they're very effective against the tanks and the Syrians tried to do this on Pellet but he was a professional general so he doesn't move anywhere before artillery barrage you get what I'm saying? so if you got guys ready over here, boom boom boom, it's all over they're not there anymore, that's how you do it okay so uh, he lays out heavy uh, artillery barrage ahead of his uh, carefully advancing forces. And so when they're on the ball, right, this is, look, look where I'm pointing over here. Here's, uh, as you see, oops, pellet, you can see that, right? I don't know why it doesn't show. Right there. Yeah. Right? And he's going to drive up, as you can see, with that blue business. He's going to have a hard fight. But they're going to do it. That's what happened. Okay, this is Monday. This is two days after the war started, okay, in the third day. And it's going to be tough, but they're going to do it. This is very far away from saying the Bayashlishi is falling. Uh, I say it's weird because the central front wasn't really reinforced yet, if you follow what I said before. 
And so in the central front, okay, I'll try that. Thank you. He says, uh, oh, low tech, yeah, right. But I don't want to sound like one of these instructors in West Point and bore everybody. But you get the idea. He's going to be here. These guys weren't ready yet. So if you're the Syrians, you're going to fight like crazy to get here. Because look, if you get to the bridge, go around. So this won't matter. I'll say it again one more time. If the Syrians succeed in breaking through here and get to the bridge, Benot Yaakov Bridge, Dark Bridge, then they can break into Israel and, and all those fancy plans won't work. So it's a weird day because the Syrians hurled themselves again and again at Kikar Nafak, as we saw that battle before, with those burned out Israeli soldiers' faces, for another Gettysburg Day. The poor Israeli tankists were physically at the end of the rope. These are guys who have been physically fighting Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. I mean, in other words, there's no time to sleep, let alone take care of whatever else you need to do. I mean, I, I, I'm being very uh, you know, realistic over here. How do you do it? Okay? They're burned, they're wounded, they're shell-shocked, they're blinded. It took a lot of losses. This is actually the finest hour of Colonel Orior because it was the most terrible hour. Some of you have maybe uh, read uh, Tim Kavanot, which is that book by uh, Chaim Sabato. He's a Rosh Shiva. I think we're in Kakoto, one of those two places. Okay? Uh, no, go back. No, no, no. Stop. No, no, no. Wait a minute. Eh, no. No, no, no. Well, you'll take my word for it until we get to it. Here it is. Here, read that. In a book written by Chaim Sabato, who, uh, who let, later on became a uh, Kippasruga uh, Rashiva, he said, a yeshiva student who served as a gunner in Orior's brigade, the author describes Colonel Orr, that is on the third day after they've already lost so much and everybody who survives is still burned and wounded and busted and all that. He's uh, climbing onto a tank in the darkness after a day in battle, introducing himself up to the brigade commander, gave everybody a, a, a bar of chocolate. This, this is called leadership. You, it's, no, no, I'm serious. You, you establish a, a bond. You see? Get everybody from a shirt pocket, distribute his own crewmen. And he said, listen, I know it's difficult. You're young. It's difficult for me. I fought in a tough war in the Six-Day War. Okay? But this is even, this is something else altogether. But he goes on to say, listen, it's, it's whoever gives in first loses. So we simply have to hold on. There's no choice. So I know you're all wiped out. I'm wiped out too. I'm wiped out too. But I'm going into battle myself. Oh, here you have it. We've lost a lot of tanks. You're without a battalion commander, company commander, but we're going to win. Whoever hangs on longer wins. That's just the way it is. Now, in a perfect world, we'd have reinforcements. In a perfect world, they would have called up the reserves earlier. In a perfect world, but it's not a perfect world, okay? We've got no choice. Before dawn, we're going to attack towards Kushnia. Your company will provide the covering fire. Taking his leave, he said it's going to be a tough day, so get a little bit of rest. That's what you call the Band of Brothers. He said, the, the real thing. You get it? And, um, and as I said a hundred times, it's little groups like this and lower uh, officers that really save the day. It's in, in some ways, um, this is well known, in some ways, the Israeli army was its best in the Yom Kippur War, if you understand what I mean. Okay? Because uh, they didn't have the, uh, the usual, uh, um, which I say, infrastructure and training and, and, and setting the situation up. And that's what really calls for, um, you know, what you're made out of. Anyway, this is what happened. Um, and remember, it's Zacharai. I mean, he's going into battle too. It's, it's not one of his armies where he said, I guess, we expect you guys to do your thing. Bye. <laughs> you know, he, he's leading them. All right? By the time Monday ended, the Syrians and the Israelis had battered each other in the central zone, but the Israelis had held, even though with a lot of losses. So we did Saturday, we did Sunday, and now we did on Monday, especially in the central zone, as I showed you before. It's in there. And Tuesday, by the time you get to Tuesday, Israel's already bringing up forces. You follow? The reserves started being mobilized on Saturday. It takes Sunday. Monday, now by the time you get to Tuesday morning, you're starting to bring up forces. The Syrians know this, and they hurl themselves in a last big attack on Kenetra, which is in the northern part. I think many of us have been there. And uh, what do you call it? In the northern the Golan Hunts, and they hit the Israelis very hard in the north. Again, it's a, it's a battle of tanko a tanko. I mean, it's, that's what it was. It's uh, all over the place. These tanks are going at them. These tanks are going at them. And the Israelis hold with losses. This is a famous sad day, glorious day for the Hezder Yeshiva. 
as all the generals say, that's when these guys did bad. If you saw before, I had a picture or something. Yeah, with the, right. This because they lost a lot of men. If you've been in KBY, Shalvi, you know, they, you see they have these uh, what do you call Hansachot, you know, these um, memorials for people that fell in the Yom Kippur War and uh, were killed and wounded and maimed and all the rest. Of it, they lost a lot, and it's well known that on the uh, in the Battle of uh, the the Tuesday, um, these tank guys who were pulled in, as I say before, helter skelter, uh, really um, held out, fought, made a lot of carbonus. By this time, the 7th Brigade under Colonel Bengal was down to six tanks. Started with 100, now they're down to six. Now when I say six, they had 100 and then a few more arrived and a few more arrived on, on, on Sunday and a few more arrived on Monday. A little bit here, a little bit there. Even with those few coming in, they're down to six. So you get an idea what the losses are. I told you there wasn't one tank, which is interesting. There wasn't one tank that wasn't hit. The Syrians are not stupid. They realize that soon, Serious reinforcements are going to be pouring in from Israel unless they, the Syrians, break through these last six tanks and seize the bridges behind the six tanks, which will prevent the Israeli reinforcements, reinforcements from entering the Golan Heights and joining the battle. So the six tanks, the Israeli guys in the 7th Brigade, they can't stay awake. They haven't enough sleep. A person's a person. They've been fighting, if you're in the 7th Brigade, since Shabbos afternoon and Saturday night, and Sunday, and Sunday night, and Monday, and Monday night. Just to try, just get in there. Now, I'm exaggerating a tiny bit. They were able to get two hours here, two hours there, two hours there. You know, look at me. I just got back from Israel. I have a luxury of bed. I'm still wiped out from the stupid jet lag. You know, civilian, a fat civilian. These guys are, are in the, no, seriously. These guys are, 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 are in a battle situation. There's no time for a jet lag. You get it? There's no time for the battle fatigue. Now, you can be darn sure when the war is over, over, all these guys are going to be in a serious situation. All of them, what do you call it, post-traumatic, uh, uh, whatever, the language, which is only normal. You get it? You just don't let go until then. But the unbelievable amount of what you've seen, oh my goodness, I'm sure uh, the Israeli army must have had you know, a thousand uh, you know, psychologists and things like this to work with it. But right now, there's no time. As Ori or said, there's no time. And so just as, here comes a, a very dramatic uh, the story. It's very well known in Israel. They're about to break. Just as they're about to crack, 15 tanks showed up, like John Wayne. Uh, led by Yossi Mechanan, is a very famous person, officer in the 7th Brigade. He had missed the fighting on, on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday because he had been on a honeymoon in Nepal. Very Israeli. You know, secular guy, so, you know, it's Yom Kippur in Nepal, but big deal. He says, wait a minute, wait a minute. But this is the Israelis. The minute he heard in Nepal that war was on, he did crazy things to get a flight here and to get a flight there and get a flight there till finally he comes to Israel and then drive from there to the Golan, you understand? And there, get in one of these helter skelter situations. He's like a, an officer, so to say, you know, tanks, take these three tanks and go up there. And he takes 15 tanks, as it were, because it's already Tuesday. So they have more. And he goes up to the sector just when they're breaking. So you can read the, uh, he, yeah, man, he, he got famous. He's the guy on the picture. You old enough like me to remember the 67 War, the famous Life magazine? He jumped in the, uh, in the Suez Canal. The guy who took the picture was killed? OK. Uh, be sure? Anyway. Look at this. Just read it. These last few tanks fought until they were down to the last round, the six tanks. Uh, just as the 7th Brigade tanks were finally starting to pull back, they were suddenly augmented by impromptu force of 15 tanks. Syrians believed that they, the clock had run out and that the first of fresh Israeli reservists had arrived. In other words, the Syrians did not realize it's only 15. They thought it's 15 and followed by 100. Okay? And that the first of fresh reservists had arrived, Syrian offensive ran out of steam. In truth, it was a motley force of repair tanks, crewed by injured and other crewmen, who had mustered together by Colonel Ben Hanan, a veteran commander, hearing of an outbreak of war, had hurried home from his honeymoon. By virtue of its timing, the force proved to be 7th Brigade Saving Grace, as individual tanks began to augment the Syrian forces. Two here, um, the Israeli forces, two here, two there. The Syrians, exhausted from days of fighting, 
and unaware of how close to victory that they actually were, turned in retreat. Hundreds of destroyed tanks and armored personnel carriers littering the valley below the Israeli ramparts were testimony to the horrible destruction that had taken place there, leading an Israeli colonel to call it the Amakabacha, the Valley of Tears. Um, this Yossi ben Hanan himself was uh, uh, blown up in the, in the attack, and blown out of the tank, and uh, it's a whole long story. Then the Syrians came back, they almost captured him, and uh, uh, he was saved by a commando ra raid, uh, Yoni Netanyahu. You know, the one, you know, that's one of the things he did in the, in the war. The Israelis know this very, it's like if you're an Israeli school kid, they learned this in school, you know. Um, for the Syrians, now we're on Tuesday now, hold cup. The situation had not gone according to plan. Although caught off Gordon Yom Kippur, the Israelis had resisted too stubbornly. They had upset the Syrian timetable, and to make matters worse, the reserves were showed up, the Israeli reserves showed up much faster than the Syrian planners or the Soviets had calculated. Now the Syrians had no intention of being driven back off the Golan Heights. On the other hand, how could they prevent it? And by now, it's already Wednesday. Tuesday is Wednesday. And Israel is slowly but surely bringing up its formidable power. So the Syrian plan had not counted on this. So what do you do? Well, the Syrians had captured an important Israeli IDF center in Khushnea. And there's a little village I said in the show this morning, you know, in, in, uh, in my dream a trip. You know, we just came back with Rabbi Mari. It's not going to happen, not with uh, people like this. He said, in a dream trip, I would do a two-day business, a three-day business to the Golan Heights. I can show you exactly where everything would be. That would be something. But usually, as somebody pointed out to me, he says, Rabbi Katz, you'll have more luck if you take him skiing. Uh, you know, that's how people go. But there's, as, as you, all joking aside, there, there is what to see up there in these little places that look like nothing, and they weren't nothing once upon a time, 40-some years ago. A lot of good people shed blood there, as you see. So the Syrians, as I said before, they've captured a very important Israeli uh, army center in Khushnia. They planned, they, they started building it up. They used it as a supply dump, and they started massing troops there as a spring forward, springboard for a big attack once again across the Golan Heights, straight across to the Benot Yaakov Bridge, which had always been the key to their conquest of the Golan Heights. In other words, even though it's Wednesday, if at any time they are ever able to pull it off to catch the bridges, they kind of won. Do you follow that? If they get the bridges, then the Israelis can't send any more. So all the sacrifices of Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, up to Wednesday, would have been in vain. Whew. But now, Khushnia was the object of the Israeli counterattack, and from two directions. From the south, from General Pallet, as we said before, he knows this very well. And from the West now, that it's, it's already Wednesday, so Israelis were able to bring up their divisions under General Honor. And I hope I'm not confusing you. And the Syrians would put up a big defensive fight on Wednesday, inflict many Israeli casualties, but in the end, the, the uh, Syrians would be crushed. So it was a big, so you had the Gettysburg battle at, at, at Nafakh. They had this other big battle, what should we call it? You know, Vicksburg at, uh, at, at, at what do you call it, at Khushnia. These were tough businesses. Can we get that one, Jay? Yes. Khushnia. Once a thriving village in the southern Golan Heights. Today it's a scattered collection of ruins. A great monument to the ferocity of the 1973 Arab Israeli War. Syrian and Israeli tank forces clashed here in a historic encounter, now simply remembered as the Battle of Khushnia. October 9th. The Syrian advance into the Golan loses steam. As they assemble an armored division over 250 tanks at Moshinia, in preparation for a final big offensive. But in the three days since Syrian attacks on the Golan Heights began, the 
The Israelis have mobilized hundreds of tanks and thousands of reserve soldiers. Most of them stream towards Hoshina for a showdown with the Syrians. Thus, I received an order to cross the oil pipeline and advance and capture Hoshina. The Syrians held this place as their last stronghold on the Golan Heights in the sea. And for the first time since the war began, there was a plan for an organized attack with artillery and jets. The artillery started falling on Hashida. The Israeli artillery. So it's Arab Sukkot when this happens, okay, this battle. So who even remembers this stuff? Now, that's my point. Isn't it funny? We know about, uh, you know, uh, Valley Forge in Gettysburg, but who knows about, uh, about Khushnia? Uh, in the middle of the tank fights, the Syrians then try another trick. They land a large commando force by helicopter in the rear of Karnafa. You see it? So the helicopters land them in there to attack and capture the Israeli headquarters and disrupt everything. It's a bold and brilliant move that could disrupt and, and jeopardize the entire Israeli position, because knock them out at the head. But the Syrian uh, commander force is plagued with Shlamazov, because they land right, <laughs> they ran right next to the number one Israeli commando unit, the Sayert Matkal, of all places to land, commanded by Yoni Netanyahu. It's one of the famous things of the Civil War. So they ran the wrong place at the wrong time. You understand? So they land over here. He is no fool. He immediately said like this, not waiting for any weapons, everybody just grab what you got. They charge these guys like a Rambo situation, and they wipe them out with the loss of two Israelis. So it's a famous thing, you know, just running, it really, it's like a movie, you know, shooting everybody, throwing grenades and all the rest of it. Of all places to land, you know, uh, they had a shlamazo. Meanwhile, the Syrians are getting really desperate because the war's not going the way they want. And so they start sending Scud missiles, what they call at that time frogs, uh, which stand for something. But the Scud missiles, whatever. To, uh, at Israeli civilian targets. Guess where they bombed? Uh, you ever been Migdal Amik, where Rabbi Grossman is? So all of a sudden, in the middle of the Yom Kippur War, the bombs start landing over there, and because right nearby is Ramat David, you know, is the, is the Air, Air Force Base. That's really what's happening. It just mis-aimed. Mis uh, well, Golda Meir gets real angry, and they say, okay, we're going to bomb the Syrian Pentagon in Damascus, and, they, and, and the IAF, the Israeli Air Force, what's left of it starts going not over the Golan Heights where the SAM missiles are, but around through Lebanon and Syria that way, and they start bombing all over Syria. Power generators, oil refineries, and things like that. And they even bomb Latakia, which is the big uh, um, harbor, and they end up blowing up a Russian ship uh, and all the rest of it. And, and Golda Meir says, uh, you know, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Charlie, you know. 
uh, was a mistake. Brezhnev says, uh, you know, to Nixon, he said, this is an act of war. Nixon is an act of war. What are you doing in the, with the Russian ship in Latakia? You know what I mean? Like, you, you, is, is Israel aggression? You know, you have a Russian ship over there. But he also tells Israel, he said, you know, you can't go on doing this. So it's getting tricky. Um, Israel then undertakes to try to recapture Har Hamon, which had to be, now it's too late for the uh, equipment, but you want to retake that top position. They try once or twice, they get the Syrians ambush them. It's a whole long business. In the end, they do. By Sukkis, which is Thursday? We got the map here, the calendar? Yeah, here you go. Well, let's go back. So Thursday is already Sukkis, right? So by the first day of Sukkis, the Israeli army has driven the Syrians out of all the Golan Heights. Now what? The Syrians, although they're busted, have retreated in very good order. No, they did not crack and run away. And they're full of fight. This is not 1967. Let's get that straight. This does not happen in 73. The Syrians are determined opponents who will fight for every inch. The Israeli soldiers are beyond exhausted. Many are now is a time when many collapse and are, are evacuated. I mean, uh, you know, if you follow the story of each individual soldier, like this green gold guy and the others, uh, you know, by Thursday, they're just out of it. And some, as you say, lost it. You know, some said, I guess I can't do this anymore. You got to get me out of here. I'm, I, I, I just can't, uh, you know, like a battle fatigue, you know, and, which is understandable, for God's sake. And they're pulled out, and they're able to do it because now you have other ones in there, although many still stay. Furthermore, help is coming on the way for Syria. The Iraqi army has joined in. Thanks a lot. So now you have tens of thousands and hundreds of more tanks. Shkayach. Imagine what would have... No, but listen to this. What would have happened if Israel had not kicked the Syrians out of the Golan Heights by Thursday and the Iraqi army and the others would have been able to join the Syrians on the Golan Heights? It would have been impossible because they brought in 800 tanks. So those on top of everything else, they had reinforced enough 50,000 soldiers or the Ramada Golan and another 800 tanks, Israel would have been impossible. The Israeli generals back at headquarters are debating, I'm talking about General Elazar and then at the Pentagon, they said, let's stop here. At that time, we're having a terrible time in the south on the Sinai front. I'm not going to that tonight. We face possibly a full withdrawal from Sinai. Israel got kicked in the teeth. Sinai, they fought a lot worse than what I described here today. They fought a lot worse. Let's not attack a Syrian hornet's nest. And there is a lot to say for this. Because they said before, Israel can't really fight a two-front war like this. Uh, at least that's what they thought. And um, the way they evaluated it, the, Syria, the situation in Egypt is, is, is beyond grave. And so we've gone up to the line, and Syria's not you know, conquered the Golan Heights. Must speak. But Golda Meir said, interesting, and she's the Iron Lady. She said, I guess we've got to make them pay a price. It cannot end like this, because then they just messed us up. And nothing happened. I'm talking about, from, she doesn't mean from Stam revenge. If the other Arabs see that we're weak, then we're doomed because they're all gang up on us. You have to show, you understand? You have to show that you hit me, I hit you harder. And you attack me, you pay a price for it. Okay? This is why she now becomes, as they call it, the Iron Lady, you know, and all the rest of it. And uh, she said like this, it has to be clear who wins. So I need for Brezhnev and for Nixon to see they attacked us, and they ended up losing more territory than they had in the first place. And anyway, we all know the Syrians are a bunch of mamzerim. Look at this. I mean, that's, be, that's, a, that's a compliment. Can you find that piece? There, look at this. Read this. Just read this. The Syrian minister, Mustafa Klaas, told the Syrian National Assembly in December of 73, right after the war, this is what he said in Congress. An example of supreme valor by Syrian troops. This is the outstanding case of a group from Aleppo who murdered 28 Jewish soldiers all by himself, slaughtering them by sheep, all of his comrades and ours with him. He butchered three with an axe, decapitated him, then he struggled face to face with one of them, and throwing down his axe, managed to break his neck and devour his flesh in front of comrades. This is what they're boasting about in the Syrian Congress. This is a special case. Need I single it out to award him the Congressional Medal of Honor? I will grant this medal to any soldier who sees plenty of Jews, and I'll cover him with appreciation and honor for his bravery. This is what you're dealing with. So Golden Mayor said, I guess we're not going to let him you know, just get away with having won the war and say, okay, so it didn't win, okay? We've got to make them pay a price. This is the feeling in Israel. So in Sukkot, Israel invades Syria. General Khofi now recovers. He's back in overall command. You know, he, he was capable, provided, you know, he had a rest. The object of what? Is to conquer Syria? They can't do that. Get near Damascus. 
which is not that far away. Uh, if you get close enough to, to uh, have the artillery bombard Damascus, then Israel can claim that we won. The fighting will therefore take place in a very narrow area called the northeastern part of the front. So without getting too detailed, it'll be like a bulge at the top near Hermon, on the way up to Damascus, and General Pellet, and General, uh, what do you call it? There you go. That way. All the way in the northern front, not the whole line. <coughs> Israel has limited troops. Uh, Israel hopes that if the Syrians are hit harm, hard on their home turf, they'll collapse. And that's why they have that. That's not really true. They will be hit hard, but they will not collapse. The Syrians dig in and fight very stubbornly. That's what happened. Now, Brezhnev, of course, is getting, you know, trying to help Syria. He says, this is naked aggression. And Nixon says to him, naked aggression? You started it. You tell me naked aggression? You know, uh, what a chutzpah. The, who has to lead the attack? 7th Brigade, the poor guys. General, Colonel Orr. The same guys who have been fighting on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Again, Ive. And also frontal attacks, straight up attacks, which is never a good idea. Uh, as they say, I've written about it, somebody saw, you know, the good generals don't do frontal attacks. The bad generals do frontal attacks. Because then you lose a lot of men unnecessarily. And here, they don't, Israel doesn't have the time to prepare and do it right and do the fancy stuff. They can, but it didn't lend itself that it. They've been fighting for straight up. They know as well as anybody else, time is running out. Attrition is running out. They just have to go and bust their way through forward to Damascus, even though it's going to cause casualties. It's not a simple matter, of course. Um, and the goal is, let's see here, can we get the map? Uh, next map? Yeah. I can't read it so well, but up here is Sasa, right? Is that it? Is that yeah. it? Yeah, it's around there. If you get up to there, then, you, then you're within range of bombing Damascus. Meaning you have to get to Sasa. So uh, what I mean by that is through artillery. So once you have an artillery range, nobody can stop you. Right? If it's airplanes, you can have anti-aircraft batteries. You can have SAM missiles. If I can get you with artillery, what can you do to me? So that's what Israel's goal was. And uh, the Syrians fight for every inch and every village. But the IDF storms the first line of defense. It was a bloody battle. So here we are fighting on Sukkot. Bad enough, it started on Yom Kippur. It's straight, non-stop fighting into Sukkot. Uh, General uh, Raful Eitan, uh, after making a couple of mistakes by trying to launch frontal attacks or, and capture these villages and the Syrians fight like crazy, then he says, let's do it the old-fashioned Israeli army way. Uh, land commandos there at night. They know exactly what they're doing. This is their training. I told you before about racehorse and, 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 and cart horse. You are supposed to use, like a surgeon, the right instrument for the right place. So the Israeli commandos are exactly trained in night fighting and taking a, a, a position. So, that, so after losing 100 men on a frontal assault, they lost four men on the commando assault. Uh, strategically, the Syrians are hoping for Iraq to come in. Okay, He was the leader already at that time. The Israeli army tries to block this, something called Operation Petticoat, <laughs> which is they land a command, this is like a movie, they land a commando force all the way in the back of Syria where the, where the road is to from Iraq to Syria and try to blow it up and hold it up. It's not very successful. It's very dramatic. And uh, the, com the, the commander of the commandos later on became the head of the Israeli army, Shal Mufaz, if you know who that is, is Iranian. Israel has had actually an Iranian commander-in-chief. Jewish, though. Anyway, um, it's not effective. The Ira Iraqi attacks, the Iraqi tanks, arrive in Damascus, they, they, they rush to attack the approaching Israeli forces under General Don Lanner. Although surprised, the Israelis recover and give the, and give the Iraqis, who swing around to attack the Israelis from the south, a bloody nose, because Iraq wasn't used to fighting wars. And by this time, Israel, number one, had plenty of, 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 of uh, experience in fighting wars, and now, particularly, they picked up a lot of information, a lot of experience, unfortunately, in the last week. And so the Iraqis just come straight, so what Israel did was, uh, General Lanner, he says, build a box, as they call it, which means you come in like Hannibal, you know, and we line our guys here and line our guys here, and you come in the middle as a killing zone. So the Iraqis didn't know what happened. All of a sudden, boom, 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 they get blown up from right, left, and front, and they lose 60 tanks um, in a few minutes, and then later on another 80 tanks, 
and uh, without the Israelis losing any losses. Uh, but there are plenty of others, there are hundreds more Iraqi tanks on their way and thousands of soldiers. This is Israel's nightmare. Israel cannot fight all the Arabs. This is a fact, you know, don't believe all the boats. They can't take them on all, it's too many. So it all depends on them, like six they were, finishing fast. You understand? Or you fight against one and, and knock it out fast. He can't do enough. Then King Hussein sends in the army. Well, he had to. Uh, the other Arabs saying, no, what's with you? So he's in, his own generals are saying, what's going on over here? Now, he really would not like to put anything on whatsoever, but it's too much pressure. And so he sends in his tank corps into Syria, mind you, not across the Jordan, into Syria. And he tells Nixon, he said, could you please tell Golda Meir, don't shoot at my men. <laughs> I'm serious. He said, I'm only doing this for so forth. And Golda Meir says, nope. <laughs> if you're going to battle. In spite of everything, General Pella and General Lanner, who turn out to be famous people, nobody's heard of them, they were great people, proceed eventually to get close enough to Damascus to start shelling the outskirts with the Israeli artillery, which is very embarrassing for President Assad. Okay? Uh, this is not the way it's supposed to end, which him near the war. Israel does not want to capture Damascus. Imagine if they had to, I mean, look at the trouble we have with the West Bank and the Gaza, you know, try to hold the city of a million, you know, it, 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 it won't work. Um, so it's enough to, uh, at least they felt it's enough to get, give Syria an embarrassing end. Uh, this will lead President Assad to appeal to Sadat in the middle of Sukkot and say, we're desperate over here, you have to attack. That attack will be a big mistake on the part of Sadat and will powerfully affect the outcome of the war in the South and therefore on both fronts, as we shall see. But we've come to the end. Uh, by way of wrapping up over here, you see the Israel was surprise attacked. Uh, they never got their uh, chance to, to, to organize them properly. And in spite of that, thanks, as I told you before, constantly to the initiative of the lower ones, uh, they were able to hold it and, and turn it around. Um, let me say one final point. Um, in contrast to the south, in the north there was no machlekes. That's extremely important. The Israeli generals all cooperated with each other. You didn't have a, a, a competition, as we're going to see next time, unfortunately. And when an order was given, it was given. It was followed through to the best ability. So you could coordinate a plan with all the trouble. And you could execute it. And if there's trouble, somebody could come and help you. And if somebody made a mistake, and you always make mistakes, Nobody's there saying, oh, you made a mistake, let's call the news and tell everybody what a mistake you made. And the generals were basically normal people, and it, and, and, and it cohered. And because of that, and because of the heroism, they were able to make it go. Therefore, the losses were less than you would imagine. The losses were bad, but the losses were less than you imagine because of the lack of machlok and, and the general uh, coming together on the part of the Israelis. Uh, now, Obviously, you don't need me to tell you every person is dead is a, is a terrible business. But considering all the fighting that I just described to you, what were the Israeli killed? The answer is 750, 772. That's a, a small number relative to what I just described to you. Is a 26, 2700 wounded. Uh, the Arabs are a lot more. Now, as I said before, if they would have been ready, then it would be 72 and 772. We, we know that. But still, when you put it all together, this is, uh, listen close, I'm going to tell you. This is due heavily to the fact that Israel put a lot of effort and time into number one, the repair crews and the medical. You understand? And it got, it got wounded. They immediately came with the helicopter as best they could and, uh, and, 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 and pulled him out and got him to the hospital as soon as they can. It's not a simple matter, obviously, but they saved many lives that way. Um, there are many people, therefore, that survived that are around today because of what I just described. Although there are many people that are maimed and wounded as, as you can imagine. So, uh, as, as I said before, you know, one day that's the place to take a tour uh, in which you bow your head in, mem in, 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 in reverence to the unbelievable Messiris Nefesh there in the literal sense that they did to hold the Syrians back because you didn't have to persuade anybody from the private up. Everybody realized, you know, if we fold, they come in right into Israel. We know this. You understand? So we have no choice but to buy time with our lives. Um, with that, I'll close tonight, and next week we'll get to the uh, to the other part.